How can one open the door of truth? Sri Ramakrishna told the secret to his disciples, the key to this room has to be turned the reverse way. One worldly means are of no avail to one who wants to attain the knowledge of God. Knowledge is of two kinds, lower or secular and higher or spiritual. Secular knowledge pertains to the world, all book learning and even scriptural knowledge fall into this category. Higher or spiritual knowledge opens the door of truth. When a person attains this knowledge through spiritual pursuits, he or she transcends the realm of ignorance or maya and becomes free forever. When Swami Ramakrishnananda, then Shashi, was young, he desperately sought higher knowledge from the Bible, from the Hindu scriptures and also from the lives and teachings of the mystics. He was told by one of his friends that a great amount of wisdom was hidden in the writings of the Sufi mystics. Shashi recalled, I had heard a great deal about the beauties of the Sufi poets, so I determined to learn Persian in order to be able to read them in the original. I bought several Persian textbooks and began to study most diligently. Often when I was at Dakshineswar, I would go off to some corner with my books instead of staying to serve Sri Ramakrishna. One day he called me and I did not hear him. He had to call a second and a third time. When I came to him, he asked, What were you doing? I told him. He said, If you neglect your duty in order to learn Persian, you will lose what little devotion you have. Not many words, but they sufficed. By that time I had purchased 15 or 20 rupees worth of books, but I threw all of them into the Ganges. Shashi Bhusan Chakrabarti was born at 4.56 a.m. on Monday, 13th July 1863, in Ichapur village, Hugli district, West Bengal. He was the eldest of eight children. His father, Ishwar Chandra Chakrabarti, was a court pandit of Raja Indra Narayan Singh of Pakpara, North Calcutta. Ishwar Chandra was well versed in Tantra scriptures and disciplines, and was a disciple of Jagmohan Tarkalankar, a famous Tantric saint of Bengal. A great devotee of the Divine Mother, Ishwar Chandra would sometimes practice sadhana, spiritual disciplines, at night in the cremation ground, which is considered to be an auspicious place for Tantric sadhana. It is said that one night he saw the Divine Mother in the form of a little girl, who directed him to follow her and then disappeared into the temple. His wife, Bhavsundari Devi, was a guileless, pious woman. She was so shy that she would put a veil over her face even in front of her son Shashi. Shashi was brought up in spiritual surroundings by his orthodox Brahman parents. Ishwar Chandra worshipped his family deities daily and he performed an elaborate Kali worship once a year. When he was a boy, Shashi learned ritualistic worship from his saintly father. During the annual autumn worship of Mother Durga, Shashi would perform the worship service, ritual, japam, meditation, chanting for 24 hours at a stretch without leaving his seat. Physical discipline alone cannot account for such a feat of endurance, only Shashi's orthodox upbringing, tremendous willpower, deep spiritual absorption, and divine intoxication can explain this phenomenon. After finishing his education in the village school, Shashi went to Calcutta for higher English education. He lived with his cousin Sharat, later, Swami Sardananda, who was almost his contemporary. He passed the Calcutta University entrance examination and, as he was a brilliant student, won a scholarship. He passed his first arts examination from Albert College, then entered the Metropolitan College, now Vidyasagar College, for his BA. He had a wonderful academic record in college. His special subjects of study were Sanskrit and English literature, mathematics and philosophy. During their college days both Sharat and Shashi became members of the Brahmo Samaj and were inspired by the lectures of Keshav Chandra Singh, the great Brahmo leader. 
फॉर अ सर्टन पीरियड शशि प्राइवेटली ट्यूटर्ड केशब्स सन्स विद श्री रामाकृष्ण इन दक्षिण स्वोर शशि एंड हिज यंग फ्रेंड्स फर्स्ट हर्ड अबाउट श्री रामाकृष्ण फ्रॉम केशब हु स्पोक हाईली ऑफ द सेंट ऑफ दक्षिणेश्वर टू हिज कॉन्ग्रेगेशन द यंग बॉयज सेट टू ईच अदर इफ केशब चंद्रा सेन हुम वी ऑनर सो मच शोज सच ग्रेट रेवरेंस फॉर दिस परमहंसा एन इल्यूमेंट सोल देयर मस्ट बी समथिंग एक्स्ट्रॉर्डिनरी इन हिम थ्री शशि लेटर रिकॉल्ड It was really Keshab Chandra Sen who may be said to have discovered Shri Ramakrishna and made him known to the world. At that time Keshab was the most prominent figure in Calcutta. His church was always crowded and many young men were his ardent admirers. It was indeed impossible not to be moved by him. When he stood in his church dressed in his white robe and talked with God the tears streaming down his face there was not a dry eye in the whole congregation he was a really great soul and a true devotee dot for hunger for god made young shashi restless keshab inspired him immensely but could not fully satiate his spiritual hunger one day in october 1883 shashi sharat and some of their friends went to dakshineswar to visit shri ramakrishna They found the master seated on his small couch. He received the boys with a smile and asked them to sit on a mat on the floor. He then asked their names and where they lived and was pleased to know that they belonged to Keshab's Brahmo Samaj. At first sight Shri Ramakrishna recognized Shashi and Sharat as his own. Sensing their spirit of renunciation, the master said, bricks and tiles if burnt with the trademark on them retain those marks forever similarly you should enter the world after advancing a little in the path of spirituality then you will not sink in the mire of worldliness but nowadays parents get their boys married while quite young and thus pave the way to their ruin the boys come out of school to find themselves fathers of several children so they run hither and thither in search of a job to maintain the family with great difficulty perhaps they find one but are hard pressed to feed so many mouths with that small income they become naturally anxious to earn money and therefore find little time to think of god five then sir is it wrong to marry is it against the will of god asked one of the boys The master asked him to take a certain book down from the shelf and directed him to read a particular passage that quoted Christ's opinion of marriage for there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake he that is able to receive it let him receive The master then asked him to read Saint Paul. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows it is good for them if they abide even as I but if they cannot contain let them marry for it is better to marry than to burn. Someone interrupted saying do you mean to say sir that marriage is against the will of God and how can his creation go on if people cease to marry? Shri Ramakrishna smiled and said Don't worry about that. Those who wish to marry are at perfect liberty to do so. What I said just now was between ourselves. I speak on what I have got to say. You take as much of it as you like and no more. Shri Ramakrishna asked Shashi whether he believed in God with form or without form. Shashi replied frankly, I am not certain about the very existence of God. so i am not able to speak one way or the other six this simple and direct reply pleased the master very much when the boys took leave of him the master said to shashi please come again and alone seven after the first meeting shashi felt an irresistible attraction for shri ramakrishna and he began to visit him frequently after i had listened to shri ramakrishna he later recalled I had nothing more to say. I did not have to talk. Often I would go to him with my mind full of doubts 
which I wished him to clear away. But when I reached the temple I would find his room full of people and would feel very much disappointed. As soon as he saw me he would say, Come in, sit down. Are you doing well? Then he would return to his subject but invariably he would take up the very doubt that was troubling my mind and clear it away completely. 8. Sri Ramakrishna always tested the genuineness of his disciples using various methods before accepting them into his inner circle. Long after Sri Ramakrishna's passing away, Shashi told the following incident to Swami Parmananda who related it to his American disciples years later. When Swami Ramakrishnananda first came to Sri Ramakrishna, he wanted to touch Sri Ramakrishna's feet that he might take dust of them, for in India, in relation to the holy, this is considered the greatest blessing. But Sri Ramakrishna withdrew his feet. Swami Ramakrishnananda thought that it was because he was unworthy. Afterwards, Sri Ramakrishna told him that it was only to increase his yearning. A small soul, full of pride and egotism, would have felt injured, but a big soul is only filled with greater longing. Nine on the very first day, Ramakrishna recognized that Shashi and Sharat belonged to his inner circle. On 23rd December 1885, the Master said to M. When God assumes a human body for the sake of his devotees, many of his devotees accompany him to this earth. Some of them belong to the inner circle, some to the outer circle, and some become the suppliers of his physical needs. The Divine Mother used to reveal to me the nature of the devotees before their coming. In a vision I saw that Shashi and Sharat had been among the followers of Christ. Then one day while Shashi was hurriedly passing through the Master's room looking for a particular object, Ramakrishna said to him, whom you are looking for, he is here, 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 eleven. Immediately Shashi's eyes fell on the blissful form of the Master. He then realized that Sri Ramakrishna was the pole star of his life. Gradually, Shashi became acquainted with Narendra and other young disciples of the Master. One day Shashi and Sharat visited Narendra in his home and talked about the Master for many hours. Narendra told Shashi and Sharat, He is bestowing love, devotion, divine knowledge, liberation and whatever else one may desire on whomsoever he likes. Oh, what a wonderful power! He can do anything he likes. 12. Observing that other disciples were experiencing ecstasy and devotion, one day Shashi prayed to the Master for those spiritual experiences. The Master said to him, if you have that experience, you won't be able to serve me. Then I don't need it, replied Shashi. I don't care for that ecstasy, which will take away my opportunity to serve you. 13. Another day Shashi noisily ripped a piece of cloth in the Master's presence, startling him. Because of Ramakrishna's experience of oneness, when the cloth was being torn, he felt as if his own chest were being torn as well. When a person is highly spiritually evolved, his physical and mental systems become very sensitive. The Master did not like his disciples' rough action, so he said to him, What are you doing? Never tear the cloth in that way. The serpent power, Kundalini Shakti, which is within me, may snap at you. Be careful, 14 from his boyhood, Shashi cherished a great regard for religious books. He was a keen student of the Bible and Chaitanya Charitamrita, life of Chaitanya and had studied many lives of the mystics. He was a strict follower of religious disciplines. After studying Chaitanya's life he resolved to be a vegetarian for the rest of his life. Sri Ramakrishna also advised him to eat only vegetarian food and to observe the caste system. This later helped him to work among the orthodox people in South India. 15. The Master demanded from his disciples physical as well as mental cleanliness. One day he said to Shashi, Please scrape your tongue daily, 
otherwise I won't eat from your hand. 16. It takes more time and effort to prepare a delicious dish than it does to eat it. Similarly, preparation and training are very important for God-realization, which may dawn on a person in the twinkling of an eye. It is therefore important to learn how a Godman like Sri Ramakrishna trained his disciples. This can be discovered from the records and reminiscences of disciples like Shashi, who recalled. It was only on Sundays that there was a crowd at the temple. On other days the master was left alone with his few chosen ones. Not everyone could stay with him, only those whom he chose to have. And why did he keep them? In order that in one night he might make them perfect. Just as a goldsmith gives shape to a lump of gold, so he would mould them in such a way that their lives would be transformed, they would never forget the impression he had stamped on them. Sri Ramakrishna possessed the peculiar power to discern at once whether a man was fit to serve him or not. Sometimes people would come and want to stay with him, but seeing their unfitness he would tell them with childlike frankness, you had better go home. Occasionally there would be a feast and the master would sit with his disciples. Sometimes a man would come whose character was blemished but who would sit with him in the attempt to appear good. At once Sri Ramakrishna would discern his character and say, Here is a man who is not pure. He will spoil my children. Without hesitation, he would send him away. When he was alone with his special disciples, they would sing and talk and play together. If a visitor came, he would tell him, go and have a bath, eat something and rest a while. About two o'clock he would begin to talk and he would go on teaching for five or six hours continuously. He would not know when to stop. Sometimes the master would wake at four in the morning and he would call the disciples who were sleeping in his room, saying, What are you all doing? Snoring? Get up, sit on your mat, and meditate. Sometimes he would wake up at midnight, call them, and make them spend the whole night singing and praising the name of the Lord. All the disciples were still at a malleable age, in their teens or early twenties, Two were scarcely sixteen, and the master played with them as if they were little children. He was very fun-loving and was discovered near the Panchavati one day by a visitor, playing a game of leapfrog with his boys. Sometimes he would send them into peals of laughter by his mimicry. Then again he would be grave and wake them long before the dawn, and make them sit in meditation on the mats on which they had been sleeping. Again at the evening hour he would tell them to go to the banyan tree and meditate. The master said, If you will practice even one sixteenth part of what I have practiced, you will surely reach the goal. That sixteenth part of individual striving, however, was essential. He could not impose realization as one pastes a picture on a page. Someone said to him once, 268 times you have the power by a touch to make a man perfect, so why do you not do it? Because if I did, he answered, the person would not be able to keep perfection. He must grow to it and be ready to take it. His method was peculiar. He did not tell a man to give up everything. On the contrary, he would say, go on, my children, and enjoy all you wish. The Divine Mother has given this universe for your enjoyment. But as you enjoy, remember always that it does not come from yourself but out of the Mother's bounty. Never forget her in your pleasure, but always recognize that it is from her. In this way, by becoming mindful of the Mother, the person would gradually lose all taste for the pleasures of the senses. The Master never told us that anything was wrong. On the contrary, he used to say, Go and have a good time. The responsibility will be mine. He knew there was nothing wrong in the pleasures of the world, 
that by tasting them, his children would come to realize their worthlessness and would be satisfied only with higher pleasures. He was not merely the helper of the good, he was also the helper of the wicked. He tolerated and loved both. He wanted his children to always be happy. And if one of us came with the least shadow on his face, the master could not bear that, he would at once scold us. Just by looking at a man he could tell what that person was fit for. If he saw that he was falsely leading a religious life, he would say to him, go and get married. If he saw that a man was ready to renounce, he would not ask him directly to give up, but he would direct his mind in such a way that the man would, of his own accord, renounce. He used to say that by seeing even one corner of a man's toe, he could make out just what sort of man he was. At one time there was a very poor boy who used to come almost daily to Sri Ramakrishna, but the master would never take any of the food he brought. We did not know why. Finally one day Sri Ramakrishna said, This poor fellow comes here because he has a great desire to be rich. Very well. Let me taste a little of what he has brought. And he took a small quantity of the food. The boy's situation began to improve immediately and today he is one of the most prosperous men of Calcutta. There was one boy who often came to Dakshineswar to see the master. One day the master took him into the temple and, touching his heart, gave him a vision of the divine. Afterwards, he explained that the boy would not be able to realize God in this life, but he wished to show him what he would attain in his next birth so that he might be encouraged to struggle for it. I remember that once he took the karma of a certain devotee on himself and suffered from a serious bodily disorder for six months. God may come at any time, he would say, but this need not frighten us. When the king wishes to visit one of his servants, he knows the servant will not have soft cushions and the proper things with which to receive him, so the day before he comes, he sends other servants to cleanse everything and prepare for his reception. Similarly, God, before he comes to the heart, sends servants to make it ready for his coming. And who are those servants? Purity, chastity, humility, loving kindness. Or again, as in the east the red glow in the sky tells us that the sun is about to rise, so just by looking at a man one can tell whether God will come soon to him. 17. Sri Ramakrishna trained his disciples to be great teachers of the world. He first asked them to realize God, and then, once they had his command, to teach people. Otherwise the teachings would not be effective. Shashi narrated how Sri Ramakrishna questioned a Pandit in Dakshineswar. Have you a commission from the Lord? As he commanded you to teach. When the Pandit admitted he had not, Sri Ramakrishna said, Then all your lectures are worthless. People will hear you for a time but it will not last. What he said proved to be true. Soon the Pandit lost all his popularity, everyone began to criticize him, and he had to give up. Then one day he came to Dakshineswar and prostrated before Sri Ramakrishna, saying, All this while we have been chewing the chaff, and you have been eating the kernel. We have been content with dry books while you have been enjoying life. 18. A person who sees faults in others does not realize that those faults are within. What is inside comes outside. Fault finding is very injurious to spiritual life. Shashi recalled. The master never condemned any man. He was ready to excuse everything. He used to tell us that the difference between man and God was this. If a man failed to serve God ninety-nine times, but the hundredth time served him with even a little love, God forgot the ninety-nine times he had failed and would say, Oh, my devotee served me so well today. But if a man served another man well ninety-nine times, and the hundredth time failed in his service, 
the man would forget the 99 good services and say, that rascal failed to serve me one day. If there was the least spark of good in anyone, Sri Ramakrishna saw only that and overlooked all the rest. 19 Love manifests through action, manner, and feelings. A real lover always takes the position of a giver. The lover enjoys giving everything, body, mind, possessions, wealth, to the beloved. Like his cousin Sharat, Shashi was not well-to-do. He knew that the master was very fond of ice, so he bought a big piece and carefully wrapped it with paper and then with a towel so that it would not melt. He walked over six miles from Calcutta to Dakshineswar. It was a hot summer day and the scorching sun blistered his body. When the master saw him, he began to say, Ah! Ah! as if he were in pain. When Shashi asked him what was the matter, the master said that as he looked at Shashi's body, his own began to burn. The master was overwhelmed by Shashi's sincerity and love. Strange to say, the ice did not melt at all on the way. Last days with the master For almost two years, Shashi regularly visited the master at Dakshineswar and acquired great spiritual treasures from him. In the middle of 1885, Ramakrishna developed throat cancer and the devotees arranged for his treatment in Shampukur, Calcutta. Holy Mother took the responsibility of cooking special food for the Master and some young disciples began to nurse him under Narendra's leadership. Shashi would eat at home, then serve the Master at night. Shashi was then preparing for his BA examination. His parents had great expectations for him because he was their eldest son and a brilliant student. Now Shashi faced a great dilemma, should he serve his guru or build his career through study? His discriminating mind selected the first one. He stopped going home, gave up his studies and became a full-time attendant of the master. An old neighbor of Shashi asked him, why don't you serve your Guru after the examination? Shashi replied, Sir, could you give me any guarantee that I shall not die before that examination? 20. When his father begged him to return home, he replied, For me the world and home are both like a place infested with tigers. 21. His father even used a mantram to get his son back home, but this failed. It is said that on one occasion Shashi's father criticized Sri Ramakrishna in front of him. Immediately Shashi was ready to stab him, saying, Who is my father? Ishwar Chandra was pleased with his son and said to him, Yes, your devotion to your Guru is genuine. 20 to the doctor advised the devotees to move Sri Ramakrishna from smoggy, congested Calcutta to a clean, quiet country place. Accordingly, the master was taken to the Kos Sipore Garden House on 11th December 1885. Shashi followed the master like a shadow. All of the attendants were great devotees, but Shashi's devotion was special. He was the very embodiment of service. He was convinced that service to the Guru was the highest form of religion. He practiced no spiritual discipline, knew no other asceticism, Travelled to no holy places. Forgetting his personal comfort, food or rest, he was always ready to serve the Master. His life's purpose was to alleviate the Master's suffering. Indeed, he would have given his life if he thought that would cure him. Everyone marvelled at his indefatigable energy, his endurance and his boundless love for the Master. Love is reciprocal. Ramakrishna poured his fountain of love into his disciples and captivated them forever. It was winter when the master arrived at the Kos Sipore garden house. Once, in the middle of a cold night, Shashi left the master's room to clean the commode. He wore only a thin cloth. On his return he saw that Ramakrishna, who was very sick, had somehow crawled across the room and was reaching up for a shawl that was hanging on a clothes horse. At this painful sight Shashi thought to himself, Alas! 
In my hurry I forgot to cover him sufficiently, so perhaps he is cold and is trying to get a shawl. What are you doing, sir? Shashi asked him in a scolding tone. The air is very chilly and you should not be up. Why did you not ask me for the shawl? Filled with love and concern, the master held out his shawl and then said in a feeble voice, I felt cold as you went out almost bare-bodied on such a cold night, so I picked up this shawl for you. Please take this. 23 Shashi was overwhelmed. One winter day the master expressed a wish to eat Jamrel's star apples. It is a juicy tropical fruit, only available in summer. Shashi knew that the master was a man of truth and that such a person's wish could not go unfulfilled. Moreover, the scriptures say that nature fulfills all the wishes of a knower of Brahman. The heroic devotee Shashi inquired and discovered that someone had a Jamrul tree that produced fruits out of season. He collected some Jamruls and offered them to the master. The master asked him with wonder, Where did you get Jamruls in this season? 34 Shashi told him, and he was happy to serve the master. Sometime in the middle of January 1886, the elder Gopal wanted to distribute twelve pieces of ochre cloth and rosaries to some monks. Pointing to his young disciples, the master said to him, You won't find better monks than these. Give your cloths and rosaries to them. Instead, Gopal offered them to the master and he himself distributed them among his young disciples. Shashi got an ochre cloth, the garb of a MQNK, from the master. Thus Sri Ramakrishna himself founded his monastic order. Shashi, Niranjan and others kept vigilant eyes on the master so that outsider might not disturb him. During this time a woman who was mentally ill had been troubling everyone in order to see the master. She was very unpredictable. Sometimes she would cry and shout. From time to time she would enter the master's room without notice and disturb his rest. If she comes again, said Shashi, I shall shove her out of the place. The master tenderly said, No, no. Let her come and go away. 25 Even when he was on his deathbed, the master continued to teach his disciples that the highest truth cannot be experienced without renunciation and purity. On 22nd April 1886 M, recorded in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. In the evening Rakhal, Shashi and M were strolling in the garden at Kosipore. M. The master is like a child beyond the three gunas. Shashi and Rakhal, he himself has said that. M. He said, in such a state of mind one sees God constantly. In him there is not the slightest trace of worldliness. His mind is like dry fuel, which catches fire quickly. Shashi, he described the different kinds of intelligence to Charu. The right intelligence is that through which one attains God, but the intelligence that enables one to become a deputy magistrate or a lawyer, or to acquire a house, is a mean intelligence. It is like thin and watery curd which merely soaks flattened rice but does not add any flavor to it. It is not like thick, superior curd. But the intelligence through which one attains God is like thick curd. M. Ah, what wonderful words! Shashi Kali said to the master, What's the good of having joy? The Bheels, a savage tribe, are joys. Savages are always singing and dancing in a frenzy of delight. Rakhal, he, meaning the master, replied to Kali, What do you mean? Can the bliss of Brahman be the same as worldly pleasure? One cannot enjoy the bliss of Brahman unless one completely rids oneself of attachment to worldly things. There is the joy of money and sense experience, and there is the bliss of God-realization. Can the two ever be the same? The Rishis enjoyed the bliss of Brahman. 26. Sri Ramakrishna lived at the Kosipore garden house for the last eight months of his life, 
and during this period Shashi hardly went out. During the chariot festival of Lord Jagannath, the master asked Shashi to go out and see the festival. At first, Shashi declined, unwilling to leave him alone on his sickbed. But when the master insisted, he went to a place close to the garden to see the festival. At the festival, Shashi purchased for only two pies a small knife to cut lemons for the master. The master was delighted to see the knife and said, you should not fail to visit such festivals and make some purchase however small. Poor people prepare so many things on these special occasion and bring them to the fair for sale with the hope of earning something. Try to keep up the ancient traditions as far as practicable and encourage others to do so. 27 Shash's life was a glowing example of the servant attitude towards God. He forgot hunger and thirst, sleep and rest, and above all his body. At times the master had to tell him, Please go and eat, now I am all right. I don't need you at present. Sometimes Shashi would fan the master non-stop for hours. Feeling Shashi's aches himself, Ramakrishna would take the palm leaf fan from his hand and give it to Latu. Towards the end of his life, the master said to Shashi, Look, you boys have tied me with this loving service. If you let me go, then only can I go. 28 on 16th August 1886, Sri Ramakrishna passed away. Shashi left this graphic account of the master's last day. We all thought he was better because he ate so much more supper than usual, and he said nothing of going. In the afternoon, actually eight or nine days earlier, he had asked Jogin to look in the almanac and see whether it was an auspicious day. Also he had been telling us for some time that the vessel which was floating in the ocean was already two-thirds full of water and soon the rest would fill up and plunge into the ocean. But we did not believe that he was really going. He never seemed to mind the pain. He never lost his cheerfulness. He used to say that he was all well and happy, only there was a little something here pointing to his throat. Within me are two persons, he would declare. One is the Divine Mother and the other is her devotee. It is the devotee that has been taken ill. When Sri Ramakrishna gave up his body, I think it was the most blissful moment of his life. A thrill of joy ran through him. I myself saw it. I remember every incident of that last day. Our master seemed very well and cheerful. In the afternoon he talked for fully two hours to a gentleman who had come to put some questions to him about yoga. A little later I ran some seven miles to bring the doctor. When I reached the doctor's house he was not there, but I was told that he was at a certain place, so I ran another mile and met him on the way. He had an engagement and said he could not come, but I dragged him away just the same. On that last night Ramakrishna was talking with us to the very last. For supper he had drunk a half glass of payasam, puddings and seemed to relish it. There was, no doubt, a little heat in the body, so he asked us to fan him, and some ten of us were all fanning at once. He was sitting up against five or six pillows, which were supported by my body and at the same time I too was fanning. This made a slight motion and twice he asked me, Why are you shaking? It was as if his mind were so fixed and steady that he could perceive the least motion. Narendra took his feet and began to rub them and Sri Ramakrishna was talking to him, telling him what he must do. Take care of these boys, he repeated again and again as if he were putting them in Naran's charge. Then he asked to lie down. Suddenly at 1 o'clock factually 1.02 a.m., he fell towards one side. There was a low sound in his throat, and I saw all the hairs of his body stand on end. Narendra quickly laid his feet on a quilt and ran downstairs 
as if he could not bear it. A doctor, who was a great devotee and who was feeling his pulse, saw that it had stopped and began to weep aloud. What are you doing? I asked, impatient with him for acting as if the master had really left us. We all believed that it was only Samadhi, so Naran came back and we sat down, some twenty of us, and began repeating all together. Heart Om Hari Om In this way we waited until between one and to the next day. Still the body had some heat in it, especially around the back, but the doctor insisted that the soul had left it. About five o'clock the body had grown cold, so we placed it on a cot, covered it with garlands, and carried it to the burning ghat. Twenty nine. It was hard for Shashi to believe that the master had left his physical form. With tearful eyes he sat near the funeral pyre with a palm leaf fan in his hand. Sharat and Narun sought to console him. Latu took him by the hand and tried to lift his spirits a little, but he remained motionless with grief. Then Shashi collected the ashes and bones of the master and put them in an urn. He placed the urn on his head and carried it to the garden house, where it was kept on the master's bed. The next day, Ramchandra Datta, a prominent householder devotee of the master, came to the Kos Sipore garden house and asked the disciples to return to their homes. He also told them of his plan to enshrine the relics of the master at his garden house at Kankurgachi and establish a monastery there. Shashi and Niranjan were shocked and refused to accept the idea. They told him that they would not give him the relics and that they would continue the worship service of the master. Naran tried to pacify them, brothers, it is not good to quarrel over this urn. We have no monastery ourselves, and Ram Babu is willing to give the title of his garden house in the name of the master. It is a good proposition. We should begin his worship there. If we can build our characters according to the master's ideal, we will have achieved the purpose of our lives. 30. At last Shashi and Niranjan consulted with Naran and other disciples and quietly put the larger portion of the relics into an urn secretly kept at Balaram Basu's house. The remaining portion was given to Ramchandra Datta. Then on 23rd August 1886, Krishna's birthday, the disciples and devotees of Sri Ramakrishna formed a procession and walked from Ram's house to Kankurgachi, singing devotional songs the entire way. Shashi carried the times 275 urn with the master's ashes on his head. During the consecration ceremony, as they were covering the urn with earth, Shashi cried out, Oh, the master is in pain. 31 The devotees wept as they listened to Shashi's words at the Barnagore and Alambazar monasteries. Shashi reluctantly returned home, but his mind was preoccupied with the master. His parents were happy to have him back. But who can change divine providence? One evening early in September, Sri Ramakrishna appeared before Surendra Mitra and said, What are you doing here? My boys are roaming about without a place to live. Attend to that before anything else. Surendra immediately rushed to Naran's house and told him what had happened. He promised to offer the same amount of money that he used to give for the master's expenses in Kossipore. Naran and the disciples were then able to rent a house in Barnagore at 10 rupees per month and thus establish the first Ramakrishna mat. It was an abandoned, dilapidated two-storied building infested with snakes and said to be haunted by ghosts. The ground floor was dark, damp and unfit for habitation, so those rooms were used as the kitchen and for storage. Shashi was once bitten by a snake in one of those dark rooms. They set up a shrine in an upstairs room, the relics of Sri Ramakrishna were brought from Balaram's house and a picture of the master was placed on the altar. 
The articles that the master had used at Kos Sipore were also preserved in the shrine room. Shashi kept the memory of the master ablaze in the monastery by his wholehearted dedication and devoted service. His scrupulous precision and regularity of service made everyone feel the living presence of the master. From 1886 to 1897, Shashi kept a constant vigil over the master's relics, seldom visiting any holy place or leaving the monastery overnight. Because he came from an orthodox Brahman family, he performed the master's worship as one serves a living human being. He would get up at 4 a.m. and after washing would enter the shrine to rouse the master from his bed. He would then offer a twig for a toothbrush and water to rinse his mouth. Next he would offer some sweets made from coconut and a glass of water for breakfast and tobacco to smoke. He never allowed his brother disciples to help him. Afterwards he would pick flowers, sweep the shrine, wash the worship vessels and make the necessary preparations for worship. He would then go to the nearby market to buy groceries. Shashi always bought the best produce for the master. Although he did not have much money, he had a rich heart. People would comment that it was hard to find nice things at the market because of these monks. After returning from the market, he would help the cook cut vegetables and then he would go to bathe in the Ganges and bring holy water for worship. Afterwards, he would perform rituals and offer cooked food to the master. In the evening, he would conduct the Vesper service, waving a light, fanning the master and singing with the disciples the Vesper song of Vishwanath in Varanasi. Jai Shiva Omkara Bhaja Shiva Omkara Brahma Vishnu Sadashiva Hara Hara Mahadev Swami Virjananda, a monastic disciple of Vivekananda, later recalled, O oh, how wonderful was the Aarti, Vespers, of Shashi Maharaj. It was really a sight for the gods. Enveloped within the smoke of burning incense and drowned in the music of drums and cymbals, he would wave a chamar, a fan made of a yak's tail, towards the end of the Aarti. Intoxicated with God consciousness, he would repeat, Jai Gurudev. Jai Gurudev. Victory to the Guru in a crescendo of divine abandon and would dance from one side of the hall to the other rhythmically pacing the floor. What a unique feeling of ecstatic love would course through the hearts of men witnessing it can better be imagined than described. The whole building would be in a tremor. With a heavenly glow on his face he looked the very embodiment of the god of fire. The hand of the drummer would get benumbed and would refuse to move. The spectators would watch from the adjoining room and join him, all repeating in chorus, Jai Gurudev, Jai Gurudev. They too would dance in rapture and fervor. Then all would prostrate themselves before the deity and recite in chorus this verse from the Guru Gita, I bow down to the adorable Guru who by the collyrium of knowledge opened my eyes, blinded by the disease of ignorance. After this, the last part of a hymn composed by Swami Abhedananda would be sung, Let our salutations be to Ramakrishna, the taintless, eternal, of universal form, God incarnate out of mercy for His devotees and adorable Lord of all. Finally, the evening service would end with the words, Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ki Jai, 32 in December 1886, Shashi and some other disciples went to Antpur, the country home of Baburam. Inspired by Narendra, they took informal vows of monasticism during a night-long vigil around a sacred fire. Later they discovered that their vigil had taken place on Christmas Eve. A month later they took formal monastic vows by performing the traditional Virajahoma ceremony in Barnagore. Narendra gave the name Swami Ramakrishnananda to Shashi, knowing that his devotion to the Master was second to none. It is extremely important for future generations to know every detail of the beginning of the Ramakrishna movement, how the Master's disciples faced hunger, pain, poverty and persecution, 
and how they overcame them by the power and grace of the Master. The financial help of Surendra Mitra and a few other devotees was not sufficient to maintain the monastery. The young monks had to survive on the most meagre food, they had very little clothing and they slept on the floor under a single big mosquito curtain for want of separate bedding. During this trying period, Ramakrishnananda worked as a teacher in the Barnagore High School for two hours daily after lunch, foregoing his rest. He continued this for three months to support the monastery. The young monks went out daily by turns for alms and became the target of taunts and pity from the local people. The food they collected was not even sufficient for the day. Some days they lived only on rice with a pinch of salt. It was a festive day when they got a vegetable curry. One day four monks went out for arms, but unfortunately received nothing. The monastery store was also empty. Ramakrishnananda was anxious and disturbed, thinking that the master would have to starve that day as there was nothing to offer to him. Giving up the desire for food, the brother disciples became absorbed in devotional singing. Ramakrishnananda then secretly went to the house of a friendly neighbor and said to him, Brother dear, today nothing has been obtained from begging. Could you give me a few handfuls of rice, some potatoes and a little ghee, clarified butter? Although other members of his family were not sympathetic to the young monks, he gave Ramakrishnananda a half pound of rice, some potatoes and a little ghee. The Swami gladly cooked that food and offered it to the master. He then mixed it together and made some balls, which he carried to the hall and put one in the mouth of each monk. That small amount of sanctified food appeased their hunger and they were touched by Ramakrishnananda's love and concern. With delight they asked, Brother Shashi, where did you get such delicious food? Many years later Vivekanandari called. Oh, what a steadfastness to the ideal did we ever find in Shashi. He was a mother to us. It was he who managed our food. We used to get up at three o'clock in the morning. Then all of us, some after bathing, would go to the shrine and be lost in japam and meditation. There were times when the meditation lasted to four or five o'clock in the afternoon. Shashi would be waiting with our dinner. If necessary, he would, by sheer force, drag us out of our meditation. Who cared then if the world existed or not? 33 Love removes friction and factions. The disciples often had differences of opinion about how they should perform their work but not in their goal God-realization. Swami Adghutananda reminisced. Once there was a heated exchange of words between the brother disciples in connection with the shrine. It began when a householder devotee said, You fellows do nothing but act as priests to the photograph of the Master, burning incense and waving lights before it, just as orthodox priests do before the stone image of Goddess Sitla. This remark upset Brother Shashi very much and he said sharply, The money of such a householder should not be touched with a barge pole. It is cursed. Brother Loren, Vivekananda, used to be amused when he saw Shashi angry. He told him, All right then, go and beg food for your master. Very we you, responded Shashi, and I we you not touch a bit of your money either. I we you beg in order to feed my master. Loren said with a smile, and I suppose you will offer him luches, fried bread, that you get by begging? Undaunted Shashi Repuidi, yes, I we you offer him luches, and moreover, I we you serve those offered luches to you to gulp down afterwards. Then Loren pretended to get angry, no, by no means we you I a u o w luches to be offered to him while we have nothing to eat. Such a master should be thrown out. If you won't do it, I am going to throw him out myself. Saying this, he sprang up and started towards the shrine.
Shashi said something in English and ran after him. When I saw what was happening, I tried to intercede. I told Lauren, brother, why are you opposed to Shashi's desire to serve the Master Luchis? Let him go his own way and you yours. Lauren returned, keep quiet, you fool. A harsh retort was about to come out of my mouth when brother Lauren laughed such a laugh that Shashi too began to laugh. A few minutes later, we were all sitting together making arrangements for the Master's worship. 34 Swami Adbhutananda spoke of another incident about Ramakrishnananda's uncompromising attitude of service to the Master. One day brother Shashi asked the old Swami, Swami Satchidananda, to put a fresh twig, stripped of leaves and bark, in the shrine early in the morning to be offered to the Master for use as a toothbrush. The old Swami did not know that one end of the twig was to be gently beaten to soften the fibers and make them brush -like. He brought a whole twig, unbitten, as most people would use. During the breakfast offering Shashi saw this, and he rushed up to the old Swami and scolded him bitterly, You rogue, you have caused the master's gum to bleed today. I will teach you a good lesson. I cried out to the old Swami, Don't just stand there looking at him, brother. Run away. So he fled and the situation calmed down immediately. Shashi got another twig, properly beaten to soften the fibers, and threw away the first one. 35 Christmas Eve was always celebrated at the Barnagore Monastery. Some Bengali Christians from the Salvation Army knew that the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna had love and admiration for Jesus Christ, so they would visit the monastery often with the ulterior motive of converting the monks. One day they audaciously made a proposal of conversion to Ramakrishnananda and others, saying that none but Christ could grant salvation. Ramakrishnananda, who was well versed in the Bible, argued with the Christian missionaries vehemently and proved the fallacy of their dogmatic statement. After losing the debate, the shrewd missioner East tried to tempt those monks, saying that if they became Christians, they would be provided with European wives. At this affront Ramakrishnananda flew into a rage, scolded them severely and asked them to leave. After this they never returned to the monastery. Sometimes young students would come to the monastery and some even stayed during their vacations. Ramakrishnananda would inspire them and teach mathematics to those who were deficient in that subject. One of the students, Haripada, later, Swami Bodhananda, recalled. One day Swami Ramakrishnananda explained to us the technique of self-confidence. If anybody asks you if you can give talks on the Gita, don't say, I don't know the teachings well enough to give talks on them. Shake off this false timidity and say, yes. That assertion will be honest and truthful. On the contrary, if you hesitate and say, I know a little, many people will believe that and that will be wrong. Have courage and confidence in your ability. Make the resolve, I can do it and I will do it and through the grace of the Master you will succeed. 36 Beginning in 1887 some of the Master's disciples began to travel as itinerant monks, they practiced austerities in the Himalayas and other holy places of India. Between their travels, sometimes they would return to the monastery. During this period Ramakrishnananda never went out, to serve Sri Ramakrishna was his great pilgrimage. In February 1892 the Ramakrishna monastery was moved from Barnagore to Alambajar, not far from the Dakshineswar temple garden. The Alambajar Monastery was a large two-storied building with a number of rooms and pillared verandas. There were also a lawn and a pond in the compound. During its occupation by two previous tenants, a few suicides had occurred in the house and the rumour had spread that the house was haunted. For that reason the monks got it at a low rent of 10 rupees per month. Ramakrishnananda set up the shrine and followed the same routine as in Barnagore. 
one summer night when he was lying in his room and fanning himself with a palm leaf fan, he felt that the master too must be suffering from the heat. At once he entered the shrine and stood near the bed of the master, fanning him till dawn. Once Girish Chandra Ghosh, a devotee of the master, remarked, Shashi is Asana Siddha, perfect in sitting, otherwise it is impossible for anyone to worship Mother Jagadatri at a 24-hour stretch sitting in one place. 37 Later someone asked Ramakrishnananda how he was able to do it. He replied modestly, Devotion can accomplish anything. 38 Everything is not in books, a good student learns by watching his or her teacher. Ramakrishnananda was a wonderful trainer of the soul, and to live with him was an education. Swami Satchidananda, who was the Swami's helper for some time in Alambazar, recalled. One day Swami Ramakrishnananda told me, Before you sweep the room, first sprinkle a little water on the floor, otherwise the dust will go on the body of the Master. Another day he asked me to prepare betel rolls for the Master, he chewed one and said, You have put in too much lime. It will burn the master's mouth. He interested me to put the master to bed, to fan him for some time, and drop the curtain. When I went to take my supper, he asked, Have you dropped the curtain? Yes, Swami, I replied. Afterwards, he never asked me to put the master to bed, because I had not fanned the master for a sufficient time. One morning he went to prepare halwya, farina pudding, for the master and found the pan dirty. When he learned that Latu Maharaj had fried gram with oil and chili in that pan, the Swami scolded him, but later he felt pained because he had hurt his brother. Very early in the morning he would accompany me to pick flowers from the neighbor's gardens. After returning he would put the flower basket near the shrine and pray with folded hands, Master, give us a piece of land. I shall plant various kinds of flowers and use them for your worship. One day I plucked flowers and he became mad at me when he saw the quantity was not enough. Another day he told me, you go to Dakshineswar temple garden and pick jasmine and I shall make a garland for the master. I went to Dakshineswar for a couple of days, but the gardeners forbade me to pick flowers. When I reported this to the Swami, he asked M to get permission from the temple manager so that we could pick flowers from the temple garden. Swami Yogananda suggested buying flowers, but the Swami did not agree. Shri Ramakrishna used to chew some spices, so Swami Ramakrishnananda used to keep those spices in a small bag near the master's bed. He used to dry them after washing them and clean them one by one so that there would not be any tiny stone particles in them. He would check my cleaning and ask me not to hurry. While in Dakshineswar Shri Ramakrishna would bathe in the fresh water of the Ganges, so as a part of ritualistic worship the Swami would give a bath to him in the same way. Observing that I told him, it destroys my faith in the Ganges, because her water to me is always pure whether it is old or fresh. But he insisted, we must give a bath to the Master daily with fresh Ganges water. If it is difficult for you, you will not have to do it. I shall bring the water when I go for a bath in the Ganges. Sri Ramakrishna's personal articles were kept in a broken tin trunk. On a special occasion, I opened it to get some stone bowls and found that some mice had soiled them. When I told him what had happened, he asked me to clean those bowls and use them. He was very sad. On the same day, he went to a nearby shop bought a big trunk and transferred everything into it and locked it. One night the Swami could not sleep because he was shivering from cold. He thought perhaps he had forgotten to put the quilt over the Master's picture. He immediately opened the shrine and found that his guess was correct. He covered the Master's picture with the quilt, then slept peacefully.
One day in the living room after lunch, he was reading the chapter on Moksha, Liberation, from the Mahabharata and others were talking loudly. I told them, it is not proper to make noise while the master is resting. You are right, said Swami Ramakrishnananda. From then on he never allowed anyone to make noise there. 39 Ramakrishnananda was learned and devotional, but he was not a gloomy ascetic. After dinner he would dramatically read Mark Twain's The Innocents at Home and The Innocents Abroad. He would roar with laughter as he read them, and the others would laugh along with him. He enjoyed solving mathematical problems. Sometimes after his noon rest he would work on the mathematics on a slate or piece of paper. Often for inspiration he would read the episode of Rishbha Deva from the Bhagavata and comment, the spiritual state of Rishbha Deva is extraordinarily high and may be compared to that of a Paramahamsa. He also to 82 times translated the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna from Bengali into Sanskrit verses and got them serially published in Vidyodhya, a Sanskrit journal. Ramakrishnananda never had an idle moment, as he had a wide range of interests. In September 1893, Swami Vivekananda represented Hinduism at the Parliament of Religions in Chicago and became a celebrity. People's attention then fell on the Alambazar Monastery, and gradually the monks' financial problems decreased. In 1894, the disciples and devotees arranged the birth anniversary of Sri Ramakrishna on a grand scale in Dakshineswar. On this occasion, Ramakrishnananda danced in ecstasy and chanted the Master's name. The devotees and visitors were overwhelmed by his devotion. In 1895, Vivekananda wrote to Ramakrishnananda, asking him to come to America and assist in the Vedanta work, which he could not handle alone. Ramakrishnananda agreed, but Dr. Salzer, a German homeopath, advised against it because the cold climate of America would aggravate Ramakrishnananda's troublesome skin condition. Ramakrishnananda dropped the idea and carried on his usual work in the monastery. In February 1897, Vivekananda returned to Calcutta from the West and stayed with his Western disciples at Gopalal Seal's garden house, which was near the monastery. He spent most of the time with his brother disciples at Alambazar and discussed their future work with them. One day some pandits from West India came to the Alambazar monastery to test Swamiji's knowledge of the Vedas. While this discussion was taking place, Ramakrishnananda was seated in the shrine in meditation posture, counting his beads. He was praying wholeheartedly to the Master, he said later on, so that Swamiji might come out victorious in the debate. Such was his love for Vivekananda, 41 day Ramakrishnananda asked Swamiji, How can one be a good preacher? Swamiji first touched his hand to his head and said, One needs good intellect. Then touching his face, he said, One should have good looks. Touching his lips, he said, One should have a sweet tongue. Touching his chest, he said, One should have a broad, Catholic heart, Otherwise people won't listen to you. I achieved more through my loving heart than through my sharp intellect. At last, pointing to his sex organ, he said, one should have self-control. This chastity is the most vital aspect in a preacher's life. 41. As Ramakrishnananda was extremely orthodox, Swamiji asked him one day, Shashi, I want to put your love for me to the test. Can you buy for me a piece of English bread from a Muslim shop at the corner of Chitpur Road? 42 An Orthodox Hindu would not even touch that kind of food. Without any hesitation, Ramakrishnananda obeyed the order of their beloved leader. Then Swamiji put him to a second test. In March 1897, before going to Darjeeling for a change, Swamiji called aside Ramakrishnananda and said, I have given word to my friends at Madras that I shall very soon send one of my brother disciples there. 
I have selected you. You are to go to Madras and found a monastery there in the name of our beloved master. 43 Ramakrishnananda neither raised any objection nor pleaded any excuse. In the last part of March 1897, he left for Madras by ship with Swami Sadananda, a disciple of Vivekananda, and arrived there in April. Thus came to an end his vigil over the Master's remains. He was assigned to work in a new place among unknown people, in Madras. Returning from America in January 1897, Vivekananda stopped at Colombo in Sri Lanka and some important cities in South India. In Madras he stayed for nine days in Castle Karnan, which was known as the Ice House because it had been constructed by an American company to store ice on the seashore. Swamiji created great enthusiasm among the people in Madras and they asked him to send one of his brother monks to start a monastery there. With Ramakrishnananda in mind, Swamiji told them, I shall send you one who is more orthodox than your most orthodox Brahmins of the South and who is at the same time incomparable in performing worship, scriptural knowledge and meditation on God. 44 Ramakrishnananda was cordially received by the Madrasi devotees of Vivekananda. They first rented Flora Cottage, located on the same road as the Ice House. Shortly afterwards, Biligiri Ayengar, a prominent lawyer and the owner of the Ice House, offered the first floor of that castle to Ramakrishnananda to start his work. Because the disciples had learned from the Master, first God and then the world, Ramakrishnananda first set up the shrine in a room and installed a picture of the Master that he had carried from Calcutta. He then began to conduct worship service as he had before. In addition, he started to give classes on the Upanishads, Gita and Bhagavata. At one time, he gave 11 classes a week in different parts of the city, travelling by Jutka, a narrow, uncomfortable, horse-drawn carriage. Sometimes he would return to the monastery after an exhausting day of classes and lectures to find that there was no food for supper. Ramakrishnananda's life exemplified the teaching of the Gita, you are entitled to work, but never to its fruits. Swami Shankarananda recalled, One afternoon it was drizzling and the sky was overcast with clouds. A hackney carriage came in time to take the Swami to his class. The Swami asked a Brahmacharin, probably Shankarananda himself, to accompany him that day. The carriage arrived in Georgetown, where the Swami used to hold one of his classes. There was no one else in the room. The Swami waited for about a quarter of an hour but no one turned up. He then opened his Upanishad and began to read and explain with all ardour and amiability. After an hour he stopped, closed his book and said to the Brahmacharin, Well, let us go. The Brahmacharin followed him to the carriage which was waiting. On the way he asked the Swami, How is it that you gave the class for fully one hour though nobody turned up? The Swami replied, I have not come to teach anybody. I only fulfill the vow I have taken. 45 Like all pioneers, Ramakrishnananda faced various difficulties. He received very little financial help from the devotees and he lived alone for most of the first four years. It was a strenuous life. He had to perform the worship, give classes, cook and do all the household duties. In addition, he was trying to inspire and train some young people. In his inaugural lecture on necessity of religious education in youth, he said, Religion takes a man to God by making God of a man. Religion is the highest chemistry, for it analyzes the compound man into the elements ego and non-ego, the self and the non-self, the soul and the body. Religion is the burning furnace in which is burnt up all the dross of his heart. He then concluded, the heart of a young man is very pure, 
so it is a fit reservoir for religion to flow in and every young man therefore is a fit candidate for a place in the heavenly office of religion. 46. He tried to spread the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna among his students and reminded them that purity and renunciation are essential in spiritual life. He boldly declared that God and Mammon cannot be worshipped simultaneously. This made a few city leaders nervous, as they were afraid that their boys would shun family life and become monastics. They threatened to withdraw financial support if Ramakrishnananda did not change the mode of his teaching. As a true disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, he could not compromise the truth. He privately said to an ardent devotee, Am I to preach other than what I learned from my master? Certainly I won't do that. I don't care a fig for the bigwigs. They are at liberty to do whatever they like. If I am ousted today from this castle, I shall very gladly find accommodation in a room of one of my students' houses. I am a sannyasin and do not know where my next meal will come from. 47 Because he was in debt, Ramakrishnananda went to a publisher of the Upanishads in Madras and told him, I shall translate Upanishads for you. Please give me some money. 48 Realizing Ramakrishnananda's financial difficulties, the publisher arranged a monthly subscription for the fledgling monastery. The Raja of Ramnad also began to send some money on a regular basis, thus the master provided Ramakrishnananda's bare necessities. In June 1899 Vivekananda left Calcutta for America a second time with Swami Turiyananda and Sister Nivedita. They wished to visit Madras but were not allowed to land. There was a plague in Calcutta and the ship was quarantined in the Madras harbour. This was a great disappointment to the whole city. The boat was anchored far from the wharf, and friends and devotees, who had gathered in large numbers to meet Swamiji, had to take small boats to the ship. Ramakrishnananda took a boat with some devotees. He had bought thirty pounds of flour and prepared single-handedly various kinds of salty, ninki, and sweet, gajo, snacks for Swamiji which he carried with him in several large cans. Swamiji greeted him and talked to him, leaning from the deck. He had brought a big jar of Ganges water for Ramakrishnananda. The food, fruits, flowers and other presents were drawn up in baskets and the Ganges water was lowered to them in the same basket. Prevented from touching Swamiji's feet, Ramakrishnananda said to his companion, Please ask the boatman to take us right around the steamer. Let us at least make a pradakshinam, a religious rite to encircle the deity of the two great souls whose feet we have not been able to touch today. 49. When the boatman grumbled, Ramakrishnananda offered him some extra money, thereby fulfilling his wish. Vivekananda returned from the West in December 1900. In December 1901, Ramakrishnananda visited Vivekananda at Belur. The monastery had been moved there from Alambazar in 1898. It was Ramakrishnananda's first visit to the new monastery. He was happy to see the permanent home of the master on the bank of the Ganges and also to visit Swamiji, whose health was not good. On 2nd January 1902, Swamiji initiated Brahmachari Basanta, who was with Ramakrishnananda at Madras, into sannyasa, naming him Swami Parmananda. Swami's Ramakrishnananda and Parmananda returned to Madras in the middle of January 1902. On the night of 4th July 1902, Ramakrishnananda called Sakchi Dananda loudly, Deen Bandhu. Deen Bandhu. What happened? asked Satchidananda. I saw Swamiji standing before me and he said to me, Look here, Shashi, I threw away this body like spitting out spittle and he spat twice or thrice. Fifty both Swamis could not figure out the meaning of that vision and neither of them got any more sleep that night. The next day Ramakrishnananda received a cable from Belur Math 
with the sad news of Vivekananda's passing away. The Swamis cried for their beloved leader and arranged for a big memorial meeting in Madras. Swami Shankarananda reminisced. One summer morning, between 1902 and 1903, Swami Ramakrishnananda returned from his classes by 10.30 a.m. in a hackney carriage. After entering his room, he stripped himself, sat on the edge of his cot and began to fan himself. Seeing him in such a plight owing to the summer heat, the Brahmacharin began to fan him from behind. After a minute or so, the Swami threw away his fan and with clenched fists threw out his arms as if to fight with somebody. He began to say, It is for you that I suffer so much. See, what suffering I go through. The next moment he fell flat on the floor with outstretched hands and joint palms and began to rub his face on the carpet, saying, No brother, no brother, excuse me, excuse me. What you have done is perfect. It is all right, it is all right. He got up with flowing eyes and blissful countenance and cast a divine look around before he sat again. All this was with Swami Vivekananda, who had sent him to Madras to live the life as moulded by Sri Ramakrishna. 51 Swami Vishuddhananda wrote in his memoirs. Once I saw Swami Ramakrishnananda praying before an oil painting of Swami Vivekananda after his return from a lecture tour. I overheard his fervent prayers as he bowed down before him, O my beloved brother, you are verily the accredited representative of Sri Ramakrishna and it is you who have sent me over here to propagate his message. I am only carrying out your commands. I beseech you to see to it that no pride or self-esteem enters my heart, no thirst for name or fame disturbs my mind. All the burden and the responsibility that you have placed upon me are verily yours. Bless me so that I may carry on the work of our Master only as an instrument in His hands and that I may offer all the fruits of work unto Him. Guide me always in the right path. What a glorious example of self-surrender and dedication to God and His work 52 there is a saying, one should adore the children of the Guru like the Guru. Ramakrishnananda's love and esteem towards his brother disciples almost bordered on worship. Once the Swami was in Irnakulam, South India, and stayed with Mr. Duri Swami Ayer, a prominent lawyer. Upon entering the house, Ramakrishnananda told Mr. Kair, I have heard that Swami Vivekananda stayed in your house in his itinerant days. This is a holy place. I wish to see first the exact place or room where he stayed. Mr. Ayer replied, he was seated when he came in, even where we stand no W. At once Ramakrishnananda rolled on the floor and kissed the ground, for to him the very dust of the place where his leader had been was sacred. 53 Perfection in life comes from good and systematic training. Several monks who lived with Ramakrishnananda from 1897 to 1910 were unanimous in their opinion that the Swami was a strict disciplinarian and a hard taskmaster. Ramakrishnananda established the routine in the Madras monastery. All the monks got up at 5 a.m. and practiced meditation in their rooms. The Swami opened the shrine and performed the morning service and food offering. Then he returned to his room and recited the Chandi, the Gita and the Vishnu Sarnama. After half an hour, one monk removed the food tray from the shrine, another monk cleaned the shrine and worship vessels and another monk fixed the breakfast. After breakfast Ramakrishnananda and some of the monks cut vegetables, while they worked, one monk read a scripture and the Swami then explained its meaning. Punctually at 11 a.m. Ramakrishnananda went to the shrine to perform the daily worship. After the food offering at 12.30 p.m., the shrine was closed. After lunch, the monks rested. At 3 p.m. they went to Ramakrishnananda's room. There, 
One of the monks read the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Life of Chaitanya, and the Swami explained it with parallel examples from the life and teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. Punctually at 4 p.m. the shrine was opened. In the evening there was a Vesper service. At 8.30 p.m. food was offered to the Master and at 9 p.m. the shrine was closed. After supper, Ramakrishnananda told stories about the Master and Swamiji with his natural enthusiasm. Only a person who loves has a right to govern or punish. Ramakrishnananda had a loving mother's heart, but he could not tolerate any kind of mistake or dereliction of duty. He expected the monks to be precise and prompt in action, and punctual and attentive in their habits, or else he would scold them severely. He was famous for rebuking and correcting the monks. Once Ramakrishnananda scolded Swami Sharvananda so severely that he almost broke down because he had never been so severely reprimanded. Seeing him weeping, Ramakrishnananda told him affectionately, Do you know what Sri Ramakrishna used to say? A blacksmith first puts a lump of iron into the fire, when it becomes red hot, he puts it on the anvil and beats it into shape. That is how an unformed lump of metal is shaped into a useful article. All of you are like that unformed lump, and it is for your good that you are put to the forge and beaten into shape on the anvil by such scoldings. 54. Indeed, his method was that of the sledgehammer blow of the blacksmith. Many came, but only a few genuine ones withstood his test. P. M. Mudaliar recalled. He was a strict disciplinarian though he heeded not external respect and regard. He used to correct such of the habits of students as are obstructive to spiritual progress. Once a student was found sitting in his class with his chin resting on the palm of his hand. He at once said, Do not sit like that, it is a pensive attitude. Another day one student was found gently shaking his legs while sitting on a bench and the Swami said to him, Stop shaking, it is not good and conducive to well-being. Whenever any student drank water while standing, he would enjoin him to sit and drink. He was taking so much interest in the spiritual welfare of his students and even regulated their habits. 55. The storyteller plays an important role in spreading the Indian religious tradition. In an informal setting, people absorb spirituality unconsciously from the teacher. Every night after food, said Swami Shankarananda, all brothers used to come to Swami Ramakrishnananda, who would talk to them on various subjects till it was time to retire. Sometimes he would talk about the master's physical formation, how his soles and palms were soft and had a reddish tinge, and so on, how he was careful about every little thing that was in his room at Dakshineswar, and how he had taught his disciples to keep things in their proper places after using them. He was always carefully watching over them, and knew whatever doubts and misgivings arose in their minds. He would correct them as suited each of them without letting any of them know but they would very soon feel ease and tranquility restored and the absence of any mental struggles. Sometimes the Swami would talk about the funny expressions and gestures the Master used to make or the mimicry of other persons at Dakshineswar, even without any reservation with regard to the use of abusive language. 56 Castle Karnan came up for auction after the death of Mr. Biligiri Ayengar in 1906. A devotee tried to acquire the house for Ramakrishnananda, but he was outbid by a rich landlord. When the auction was going on, Ramakrishnananda was seated on a bench in a corner of the compound. From time to time a devotee reported the progress to him. He calmly said to the devotee, Why do you worry about it? What do we care who buys or who sells? My wants are few. I need only a small room for Sri Ramakrishna. I can stay anywhere and spend my time in talking of him. 57 As anticipated, 
the Swami had to move out of the main building and temporarily take shelter in the gatehouse of the same compound. Within five years of his arrival in Madras, Ramakrishnananda became well known in the city and his work was appreciated by many. Beginning in 1898, Ramakrishnananda began to celebrate the birth anniversary of Sri Ramakrishna on a large scale and many local people attended. The Swami and the devotees deeply felt that a permanent home for the Master was needed. In 1902 they had raised 4,100 rupees for their building fund and in 1906 a student of the Swami donated a piece of land on Brodie's Road in the Mylapore area. On an auspicious day, Ramakrishnananda conducted the religious ceremonies and Swami Abhidananda, who was visiting from the USA at that time, laid the foundation stone. The building was constructed at the cost of 5,500 rupees, the Swami dedicated it on 17th November 1907 and moved into the new ashrama shortly afterwards. Ramakrishnananda was as elated as a child and said to a devotee, this is a fine house for the master to live in. Realizing that he occupies it, we must keep it very clean and pure. Later the Swami humorously said, I was in Triplicane, Castle Karnan and Parthsarthi, Krishna subjected me to many trials, but now Kapliswara, Shiva, has drawn me to him. You know he is the Lord of Dhikshus, Mendicants, as his name means, and he is sure to protect me hereafter. 58 p.m. Mudalya recalled Ramakrishnananda's love for Christ. He was very orthodox, yet he possessed a tolerant heart. Once he had occasion to go to Sadapet in response to a dinner invitation by a student of his. Swami Parmananda and myself accompanied him. After partaking of dinner towards the evening, we went to St. Thomas Mount, which was not far off from Sadapet. We ascended the mount and saw a church at its summit. The pastor of the church, who was informed of the Swami's desire to see it, was courteous enough to open its gates. We all entered the church and to our amazement the Swami went straight to the altar, knelt before it as a Christian would do and prayed. 59 Sister Devmata, Laura Glern, an American devotee, wrote in days in an Indian monastery. He knew the Bible from cover to cover and expounded it in a spirit and with an understanding which are rare even in Christian countries. When Good Friday came, he talked on the crucifixion. My whole being was stirred by the living reality of his words and as we drove home I asked how he could make them so real and living. He sat silent for a moment, then he said quietly and simply, My master used to tell me that in a previous life Sardananda and I were Christ's disciples, sixty service and devotion to the Master Ramakrishnananda's service to Sri Ramakrishna is now legendary in the Ramakrishna order. He was an active, intelligent, independent, dauntless, heroic devotee of the Master. Swami Bodhananda recalled. Indeed, his method of service had its own character. Those who had the privilege of observing the details of his daily service at the chapel can testify to this fact. His making of the bed, putting on the mosquito curtain around its frame after the evening service, his offering of flowers on the sacred remains and the slippers, his whisper service, his ecstatic dance while chanting the hymns of Shiva and Guru, his waving of the big fan on the bed on hot nights, his cooking the meals for the offering, his deftness, neatness, promptness, and thoroughness in every detail left an indelible impression on the mind of the beholder. The whole spectacle was exalting, thrilling, and stirring. Even the hardest heart would be moved with his superhuman devotion. 61 Brahmachari Tejnarayan, later, Swami Sharvananda, was sent from Belur Math to assist Ramakrishnananda in Madras. As soon as he arrived, Ramakrishnananda asked him what he had brought for the master. When Tejnarayan replied that he had nothing, 
The Swami said in a convincing tone, Whenever you come from outside to the monastery, you must bring something for the Master. Then Ramakrishnananda learned that Tejnarayan had some leftover mangoes and sweets in his basket, which he had gotten for his journey. Immediately Ramakrishnananda said, Never mind, bring those mangoes and offer them to the Master. When Tejnarayan informed him that he had already eaten from that stock, the Swami asserted that does not matter. Fruits can be washed and offered, even if the first portion has been used by others. 62. One day Ramakrishnananda pointed to the picture of the Master in the shrine and said to Tejnarayan, Look here, my boy, don't consider that a mere picture of Sri Ramakrishna. He is actually present here. Try to feel His living presence and do your services accordingly. 63 His way of expression was unique. One day He said casually, You people call the Master an avatar or divine incarnation. Do you have any idea of what an avatar is? Then He expressed it in the language of mathematics, Swami Vivekananda and all his lectures and writings plus all the disciples of the Master and their works plus the infinite are equal to Sri Ramakrishna. 64. Devotion is contagious. Shankarananda recalled Ramakrishnananda's mode of devotion while mucking pranams, salutations to the Master. The Swami would either fall flat with his folded palms outstretched or stand and put his palms together over his heart and would press together his teeth so hard they clattered and his whole frame would become stiff, his head down to the neck would show a slight tremor. After pranams one could see his eyes slightly red-dained and a heavenly glow suffusing his face with an expression of blessedness. 65. Although Ramakrishnananda was a Vedanta monk, he was a staunch dualist in his belief in the purifying power of prasad. He always gave a little prasad to everyone who would visit, even in those difficult days at the Barnagore monastery, even if it were only a bit of sugar candy or some sweets offered to the master, kept for that purpose. The Swami firmly believed that whosoever partook of a little prasad of Sri Ramakrishna would be purified of all sins and blessed with faith and devotion. In Madras, he used to offer coconut sweets or sugar candy to every visitor and insisted that the monks distribute prasad among the devotees without fail. One generally does not vent anger upon a stranger, during times of anguish and suffering one releases frustration and anger upon those one knows and loves. One evening a few devotees came to the monastery to meet Ramakrishnananda, but he was in the shrine. They overheard him talking with someone loudly in angry tones, You have brought me here, an old man, and left me helpless. Are you testing my powers of patience and endurance? I will not go and beg hereafter for my sake or even for yours. If anything comes unasked, I will offer it to you and share the prasad. Or, I will bring sea sand for offering to you, and I shall live upon that. 66 Later they realized that the Swami was quarreling with his beloved master. Swami Sharvananda recalled another touching incident. Once there was no food in the temple storeroom, to offer Sri Ramakrishna at 4 p.m. At 3 p.m. the matter was brought to Ramakrishnananda and it greatly upset him. He took it as a test from the Master. He did not become angry with the monks for not informing him beforehand. His ire and grievance were solely turned against the Master. He burst out, You want to test me? I will eat sand and do Swamiji's work here. Sira, you are testing me, I know. But you should also know my grim resolve. I would rather die and perish here than budge an inch from this place. Do your worst, if you will. His face became ruddy and glowed in terrible anguish and fervor. He began to pace back and forth in the hall. It was a tense half hour. At 3.30 p.m. someone knocked at the front door. 
Mr. Kondia Chetai, an old student of the Swami, came with some flour, ki, sugar candy and dried fruits. He also offered 5 rupees as a donation. The Swami burst out in childlike glee and bade the monks to bring to stoves and made some nice preparations for the offering. At 4 p.m. the refreshment was offered to the master as usual. 67 love cannot be defined. A real lover gets joy and finds fulfillment in life by serving and giving his everything to the beloved. Ramakrishnananda kept the master alive in his mind through his intense love. One day he was resting when all of a sudden he had a desire to feed Ramakrishna hot luches which was his favorite dish. Immediately Ramakrishnananda got up and made the dough, then he fried luches. He placed a plate in front of the master and carried hot, crispy luches to him one after another, as if the master were eating and enjoying his favorite dish. 68 Ramakrishnananda was very mindful that nothing should be offered to the master either too cold or too warm, especially milk. Shankarananda recalled, one day when all other offerings had been carried to the shrine, the Swami came to take the milk from the kitchen. He cautiously clasped the hot ball between his palms and with a grave and attentive face began to move towards the shrine with steady and measured steps. The ball was almost full. After he had gone a few steps a little of the milk spilt on the floor. At once his teeth clattered and in a suppressed voice he said, He will have warm milk. He will have warm milk. 69 He made that remark to the master, perhaps he was mad at himself for spilling the milk. On another occasion he tested the warmth of the milk by dipping his finger into it and burned his finger. Placing the milk ball before the master he said in a complaining tone, you want to drink warm milk and my finger is burnt. 70. The first building of the Madras monastery cracked in several places within a couple of years of its construction. When it rained, water would come down through the fissures in the roof. At such times Ramakrishnananda would go into the shrine to see whether water was leaking through the ceiling. One night it began to drip inside the shrine too right on Sri Ramakrishna's picture. The Swami stood there holding an umbrella till the night passed and the rain stopped. He did not remove the picture to a safer side because that would wake his master from sleep at an untimely hour, which would be wrong. 71 Swami Sharvananda recounted this incident. Times 293 One sultry evening after supper Shashi Maharaj laid himself down on the cot and I was massaging him as usual. It must have been 11 p.m. and the heat was oppressive. He suddenly got up, tied his cloth round his waist and went into the shrine. He bade me also to follow. He stood with a fan near the cot on which Sri Ramakrishna's picture was laid for the night's rest and began to fan him. He asked me to fan Swamiji's picture, which was kept on a pedestal. He went on fanning for nearly an hour and then gently walked out of the shrine. His whole behavior could not fail to engender the feeling in my heart that Sri Ramakrishna was actually present there, sleeping there on the cot, and we were serving him. Then he went out of the room and stood on the veranda outside the building. I brought a chair for him and he sat on it. I started fanning him. Shashi Maharaj did not speak a word, as if his mind were soaring high to some transcendental region. He suddenly turned towards me and exclaimed, You see, my mind is soaring in the heights. If I sit now, I can fall into Samadhi immediately. I kept quiet and wondered at the sublimity of the situation. It must have been about 2 a.m. when he got up and said, Now let us go and retire. It was a memorable night for me to witness such a sublime spectacle. 72 with brother disciples and holy mother love unites and hatred separates. Unselfishness creates harmony and selfishness 
disharmonic. Joy and peace reign in the community where people have mutual love and respect, feeling and concern for one another. Sri Ramakrishna bound his disciples with a cord of love and fumed their minds to one ideal, one goal. In 1906, when Swami Premananda came to South India for a pilgrimage with his mother, Ramakrishnananda made all the arrangements for them and even travelled with them. During that same year, Ramakrishnananda went to Colombo to receive Abhidananda, his brother disciple, who was visiting India for the first time since going to America. The Swamis then travelled to various places in Sri Lanka and South India. Abhedananda lectured in many places and laid the foundation stone of the Bangalore Ashrama. At Ramakrishnananda's fervent request, Brahmananda, the spiritual son of Ramakrishna and the president of the order, visited Madras in October 1908. Ramakrishnananda accommodated Brahmananda, called Maharaj by the devotees, in his room, which was renovated especially for that purpose. He said, the master and his son will stay inside. I will stay out in the entrance hall and serve them. What more do I want? 73 He told the South Indian devotees, you have not seen the master, be content to see Maharaj. 74 We, Krishna Swami Iyer asked Ramakrishnananda whether the new Swami would give any lectures in Madras. Ramakrishnananda smilingly replied, what is there in lectures? He never gives lectures. Men such as he can impart religion by a mere look or touch. 75 Three days after Brahmananda's arrival, Ramakrishnananda went to Sister Devmata and asked her to buy certain things for Maharaj. Then he asked, Sister, what do you think of our president? She replied, I think he is very wonderful, but I am a little afraid of him. Ramakrishnananda leaned forward in his chair and whispered, So am I. 76 After staying some days in Madras, Ramakrishnananda accompanied Brahmananda on a pilgrimage in South India. First the Swamis went to Rameswaram on the coast of the Indian Ocean and stayed three days as the guests of the Raja of Ramnan. After their arrival both Swamis went to visit Lord Shiva and then returned to the palace. Brahmananda scolded the devotees, who were busy unpacking the luggage, can't these things wait? You have come here to worship the Lord, and that is what you should attend to first. 77 On the second day Brahmananda and Ramakrishnananda worshipped the Lord in a ceremonious way with Ganges water that Maharaj had brought from Varanasi. On the way to Madras from Rameswaram they stopped at Madurai to visit the famous Meenakshi temple and stayed three days. In this temple Brahmananda had a wonderful vision that the living image of the mother Meenakshi was coming towards him. Realizing that Maharaj was in ecstasy, Ramakrishnananda supported him for nearly an hour in the midst of a large crowd. He himself chanted the glory of the Divine Mother with tearful eyes. Afterwards the Swamis came out of the shrine. In the front hall of the temple Ramakrishnananda saw an image of Shankara, the great teacher of Vedanta, and he moved forward to touch his feet with his head, but the priests obstructed him. He pushed them aside, saying, Who can prevent my worshipping the Great One? 78 His overwhelming devotion silenced the priests, and he fulfilled his wish. Sometimes it is extremely difficult to understand what is in the minds of illumined souls. One day in Madras, Brahmananda asked C. Ramaswami Ayengar to get a picture of a South Indian dancing girl. The devotee was puzzled. But he purchased it and gave it to Ramakrishnananda, who was also unaware of the purpose behind it. He immediately hid the picture so that others might not misunderstand Brahmananda and he asked M.R. Ayengar not to talk about it unless Maharaj asked for the picture. However, Brahmananda asked about the picture and learned that Mr. Ayengar had given it to Ramakrishnananda. Maharaj did not like this interference. 
he became very cool and stopped talking to Ramakrishnananda, which was unbearable for him. Meanwhile, Maharaj asked his attendant to consult the almanac to fix a date for his leaving Madras. Ramakrishnananda could not bear the situation anymore. He prostrated at Maharaj's feet and said, Pray, be not angry with me. I am an unworthy and insignificant servant. At a mere nod of your head, a hundred shashis can be called forth. Immediately the face of Brahmananda was lit up with a smile and the cloud of misunderstanding disappeared from them. Of course, the picture was handed over to Maharaj.79 Later the mystery of that picture came to light. One of Brahmananda's Calcutta disciples was suffering from lust and he had confided this to his Guru. Maharaj took the picture of that beautiful girl, signed Swami Brahmananda on it and sent it to the devotee. The intention was that whenever the disciple looked at that girl with lust, his Guru's face would appear in his mental eye and his lust would disappear. A.T. Shankarananda recalled another incident which he had heard from Swami's Ambikananda and Dhirananda and which was later verified by Ramu, a devotee. Ramu had brought for Maharaj some pictures of dancing girls and other pictures which he had asked Ramu to get a few days before. Maharaj wanted to send them to Apresh Mukherjee, who was writing a new drama, Ramanuj, so that he could give South Indian stage effects in dress, pose, and so on. It was at Swami Brahmananda's suggestion that Apresh had begun the dramatizatikar of the life of Ramanuj, though it was staged much later. 81. It is interesting to observe how great souls differ in their opinions on work and how quickly they are able to reconcile their differences. When the inspired talks of Vivekananda was first published by Madras Math, Brahmananda took an interest in it and said that a copy should be sent to the Hindu of Madras and, after the review appeared in that daily, another copy should be sent to the Bombay Chronicle with a copy of the Hindu review enclosed. Ramakrishnananda, however, deferred on this point, he wanted to send copies to both newspapers simultaneously for review. Brahmananda suddenly withdrew his suggestion and said, Well, you are in charge of this math and you are a scholar. It is all your business. I see it was wrong on my part to interfere in this matter. Saying this, Maharaj became indifferent and sent a letter to a devotee in Puri fixing the date of his departure from Madras. Ramakrishnananda kept quiet for a couple of days, but he could not bear the indifference of his beloved brother anymore. One morning he knelt before Brahmananda and said with folded hands, Maharaj, I have fallen from your grace. If you do not bestow your blessings upon me, who will? What am I without your grace? Men like me may be created by the hundreds out of dust by your wish. Will you not forgive me? Immediately the brothers reconciled and everything went on as usual. 82 In order to invoke the living presence of the Master, Ramakrishnananda wanted Brahmananda to conduct the worship service at least once. One day Brahmananda passed near the shrine after his bath. Ramakrishnananda stood in his way with folded hands and beseeched him to enter the shrine and offer worship to the Master. Maharaj was not accustomed to performing formal ritualistic worship and asked to be excused, but it was of no avail. He had to comply with the request of his beloved brother monk, and when Maharaj entered the shrine, Ramakrishnananda quietly closed the door, and nobody knew what transpired there. 83 The disciples loved one another greatly. Once at Madras, Ramakrishnananda received a letter with the news that Brahmananda was ill. During the worship service, he addressed the picture of Sri Ramakrishna, If you do not cure Maharaj, I shall throw you away into the sea. 84. It was mainly due to Ramakrishnananda that the message of Sri Ramakrishna spread far and wide in South India. He believed strongly that the whole of the South would be sanctified by the touch of the blessed feet of the Holy Mother and Swami Brahmananda. 
He therefore worked hard to arrange their visits on a grand scale in spite of insufficient funds. In February 1911, Holy Mother went to Madras and stayed for a month in a two-storied house that Ramakrishnananda had rented near the monastery. He also arranged for Mother's pilgrimage to Madurai and Rameswaram and accompanied her and her party. Holy Mother later said, Shashi procured for me 108 bill leaves made of gold to worship Shiva at Rameswaram, 85 after Rameswaram, Holy Mother visited the Bangalore Ashrama. Observing the exuberant devotion of the local devotees, Holy Mother said to her attendant, What a pity I do not know their language. They would feel peace of mind if I could say a few words. As her words were translated to the devotees in English, they said, No, no. This is very nice. Our hearts are filled with joy. There is no need of spoken words. 86. One evening, Holy Mother and a couple of her companions climbed a hillock behind the monastery to look at the sunset. As soon as Ramakrishnananda heard of this, he exclaimed in a spiritual mood, Indeed, the Mother has become Parutavasini, the dweller on the mountain, an epithet of Mother Durga. He hurried to the place, prostrated himself before her, and recited a hymn to the Divine Mother. Truly the disciples demonstrated how to love and serve the Master and Holy Mother. This education in devotion is part of their legacy to future generations as a preacher and writer. In addition to scholarship, an ideal preacher should have passion, burning faith, personal experience, renunciation, purity, and dependence on God. Ramakrishnananda was endowed with all of these. It is said that whenever Ramakrishnananda lectured, he carried in his pockets pictures of Sri Ramakrishna and of Holy Mother. He would touch these pictures as he lectured. He would say, Whatever the Master makes me speak, I speak like a gramophone. I don't claim any personal credit from it. 87 From 1897 to 1911, Ramakrishnananda travelled all over South India, preaching the Hindu religion and philosophy as well as the message of Sri Ramakrishna. In 1902 or 1903, he went to Trivandrum as a guest of Kalipara Ghosh and stayed for a month. He lectured there and also at other places in Kerala. One day Ramakrishnananda went to visit the Padmanabhaswami temple of Trivandrum. As he was about to enter the inner sanctuary, a priest asked him if he was a Brahman. Ramakrishnananda did not answer him directly but started reciting a Sanskrit hymn in a solemn voice, No man am I, no God, no Yaksh, neither am I Brahman, nor Kshatri, nor Vaishya, nor Shudra, no Brahmacharin am I, nor householder, nor forest dweller, nor mendicant. I am the Self, the pure consciousness, 88 His melodious voice and serene look overwhelmed the priest and the others, and none barred his way. In 1903, Ramakrishnananda visited Bangalore and Mysore and lectured extensively. In 1905, Ramakrishnananda went to attend the 72nd birth anniversary of Sri Ramakrishna in Bombay. One day he told the local devotees that even the direct disciples could not fully fathom the greatness of the Master. He said, Do you think it is we who are preaching His wonderful life and message? Far from it. The Master Himself is doing it in mysterious ways. Wherever we go to preach about Him, we find that the field is already prepared. Some are blessed by Him in dreams, some get spiritual initiation directly from Him, some are attracted by the quality of His teachings, which clothe the highest truth in simple language and parables, and some are inspired by seeing and hearing His disciples. 89. In March 1905, Ramakrishnananda went to celebrate the Ramakrishna festival in Burma at the invitation of the Rangoon Ramakrishna Sivak Samiti. Every day he performed worship, lectured, and talked about the Master. 
On the festival day the Swami walked four miles to pick Nageshwar Champa flowers, which were the master's favourite. Sharat Chandra Chattopadhyay, the celebrated Bengali novelist, then an unknown young man, accompanied Ramakrishnananda on this walk. Sharat had read Darwin, Tyndall, Mill, and other Western thinkers and considered himself an atheist. On the way, Sharat asked, Why do you worship so much, Swami Ramakrishnananda? Because I derive immense joy from it. Sharat, is ritual then the highest form of worship? Swami, to see God everywhere is the highest worship. The second best is meditation. The third, prayer and japam. And the last, external worship. Sharat, then why do people perform such pompous worship? Swami, worship is not at all an external affair, it comes from the heart. Ordinary people perform worship either to escape from the displeasure of God or in expectation of fulfilling some desires. All these are low motives. Real worship is not done till devotion overflows the heart and tears roll down from the eyes for a glimpse of God. During his short stay in Rangoon, Ramakrishnananda visited some important places of interest, including the Buddhist pagodas. One moonlit night he went to see the Shwedagan pagoda, which was situated in a suburb of the city. There he met an Irish Buddhist monk. This monk was very impressed when he heard the Swami's talk on the following day. Irish monk, all the religions in the world are insubstantial and narrow, Buddhism alone is true and Catholic. That is why half of humanity follows this path, and for that very reason I have adopted it. Swami, we respect all the current religions of the world, as all of them are equally true and have the same goal in view. Irish monk, who is the propounder of this doctrine? Swami, Sri Ramakrishna, the divine incarnation of this age, lived and taught this wonderful gospel. Irish monk, what is the specialty of his teaching? Swami, he realized and preached the harmony of religions. Buddha, Christ, Muhammad and other world teachers each proclaimed that the religion taught by him is the only way to salvation. The difference between Sri Ramakrishna and other prophets is that he himself preached no new religion but practiced all religions in his life and experienced the universal truth underlying them all. His message can be summed up in the sentence, As many faiths, so many paths. Another day, knowing Sharat's atheistic attitude, Ramakrishnananda said to him, Atheists are in the core of their hearts truthists as they are always searching for God, though indirectly. Can they be atheists whose minds are busily engaged in the search for God? Sharat, could you tell me, Swami, why this disbelief assails us? Swami, this disbelief is a great obstacle in spiritual life. It is not only an obstacle but a disease. One will have to clear up the past life tendencies ingrained in the mind by practicing spiritual exercises and good deeds. He on whom faith descends is very fortunate. He needs nothing else. Faith in God is a precious treasure. Our disease is desire and the remedy is spiritual discrimination. God has given us the power to discriminate between the eternal and the evanescent. If we forget Him, we shall be nowhere. Sharat, why do we not see God? Swami, Sri Ramakrishna used to say, there are pearls lying on the ocean bed. If you want them, dive deep to the bottom. You can't get them if you float and swim on the surface. God does exist, and if you wish to see Him, you must undergo a regular course of spiritual discipline for a certain period. Sharat, if God always thinks of the welfare of human beings, why then have they so much misery? Swami, God is all auspicious and all powerful. Whatever He does is always for the good of all beings. Our parents wish for the welfare of their children, but they are not all powerful. Endowed with these two qualities, if God allots sorrow and suffering to anyone then know for certain that it is His blessing in disguise. What we call misery is in fact His kindness.
we forget God in our greed for transient pleasures. So He makes us remember Him by these little miseries. His kindness is expressed through both favourable and unfavourable circumstances. When He adorns our coveted playhouse of life with wife, wealth, friends, fame, and so on, it is the pleasant kindness of God. But when He takes them away one after another, makes us shed tears and drags us forcibly towards Him, it is His unpleasant kindness. Ninety Sharat had a long conversation with the Swami on various topics, which is recorded in the story of a dedicated life. The influence of Ramakrishnananda's visit and lectures took shape twenty years later in the form of two beautiful institutions, the Ramakrishna Mission Hospital and the Ramakrishna Mission Library and Cultural Centre. Ramakrishnananda was a powerful orator, a delightful conversationalist and also a serious writer. He was such an erudite scholar that he could lecture and write in three languages, English, Bengali and Sanskrit. He could also speak Tamil, the local language of Madras. He translated some teachings of Sri Ramakrishna into Sanskrit while he was in the Alambazar monastery. He also wrote a beautiful Sanskrit hymn on Swami Vivekananda. In addition, he composed Sanskrit mantras for the Brahmacharya woes of the Ramakrishna order. Further, he introduced and systematized the ritualistic worship of Sri Ramakrishna, which is now more or less followed by the centers of the order. He contributed many articles to the Bengali Udbodhan magazine and wrote Sri Ramanuj Charit in Bengali, an authoritative life of Ramanuj, the propounder of the qualified monastic Vedanta. This book has been translated into English. He also translated some of the writings of Vivekananda from Bengali into English and vice versa. He had so much regard for Swamiji that when he heard that Pandit Pramthanath Tarkabhusan had corrected Vivekananda's Sanskrit compositions, he became upset and commented. Those words were composed by a Rishi, a seer of truth. Dot 91 Ramakrishnananda's main works in English are God and Divine Incarnation, The Message of Eternal Wisdom, Shri Krishna, Pastoral and Kingmaker, For Thinkers on Education, The Ancient Quest, Shri Ramakrishna and His Mission and Search After Happiness, As a Monk and Teacher. Shri Ramakrishna used to say, The Sannyasin, the man of renunciation, is a world teacher. It is his example that awakens the spiritual consciousness of men. 92 Ramakrishnananda was a sannyasin of spotless character. He once said to an American devotee, Man must give up everything to God, then alone he thrives. If you study all the personal religions, you will find that all preach renunciation. Renunciation is their fundamental teaching. 93 Another time he explained the mystery of renunciation. Those who give up the world for spiritual life are giving up the uncertain for the certain, the passing for the permanent. All our power comes from renunciation. Only when we have given up our lives do we begin to live. At present we are like prisoners. We may get a glimpse of freedom now, and then, but the world falls upon us when we are off our guard and drags us back once more into our prison cells. As soon as a man finds out, however, that these little pleasures of the flesh are nothing compared with the infinite pleasures of the spirit, he wants to renounce, not for the sake of. 301. Renunciation, but because he has found something better. He has realized the hollowness of the enjoyments of the world and can be satisfied only with higher enjoyment. Renunciation means giving up a lesser thing for a greater. 94. Selfishness is sin. Unselfishness is the first milestone on the path of spirituality. A selfish person may perhaps enjoy comfort and health, but a sannyasin can never afford to be selfish. Ramakrishnananda said, so long as we are selfish, our work must be fruitless. We may deliver fine lectures, we may gain name and fame, but the actual results will be nil. 
The moment, however, that our little self disappears, at that moment our real work begins. Then we may live an obscure life and go nowhere, but we shall accomplish wonders. When we drop the ego from our consciousness and live in God, we have unlimited power. God is the only existence that is real, all other existences are unrealities behind which God exists as the reality. This Maya is so irresistible and it is this Maya which makes us selfish. Only when God is gracious to us can we lift the veil and get a glimpse of Him. Then all selfishness drops off. The word selfishness is not always understood. When by self I understand the body or the little self and I do something for that self, I am selfish. But there is a self which is beyond this physical body, when I do something for that self, that is worshipping God. The man who lives in that higher self is never selfish. Try to feel God inside yourself and you will overcome all selfishness. When you live constantly in the presence of divinity, the ego loses its power, but so long as the ego rules a man, he is a bond slave. All your anxieties and worries come from egotism and selfishness. Let go of your little self and they will all disappear, 95 Sister Devmata wrote about Ramakrishnananda's concept of religion. If Swami Ramakrishnananda was a conservative in his mode of worship, he was essentially a liberal in his religious conviction. Tolerance, universality of outlook, freedom from all prejudice, these formed the keystones of his thought structure. Religion he defined as the struggle of spirit against matter and he gave welcome to whatever helped in the struggle. When someone came with words of condemnation on his lips, I heard him say, Never find fault with any form of religion. Differences are all in the external customs. That which makes up the external is the shell. It may be hard and rough and perhaps not to our liking, but it holds a valuable kernel. The kernel of every religion is God. To whatever religion a man belongs, he has to worship the same God. The essential parts of religion are everywhere the same. It is only in the non-essential parts that differences are found. Various religious beliefs and doctrines are merely partial reflections of truth, but because they have that little reflected light of truth in them, we take them to be the whole truth. Religion may be defined as giving God His due. God alone is the proprietor of this universe, God alone is the proprietor of myself recognizing this and then giving up all to Him, that is religion. Wishing to keep all for yourself is irreligion. Throw away the idea of me and mine, giving up all to God, this is the essential of every religion.96 Only a spiritual person can create a spiritual atmosphere where one can feel peace, joy and harmony. On the other hand, wherever worldly people go they carry with them a worldly atmosphere, they talk about politics, food, enjoyment, they gossip with delight. Ramakrishnananda could not bear such people. If any visitor read a secular book or newspaper in the ashrama, he would scold him, saying, you can do that anywhere. Here you should try to think of God. 97. His whole mind was always saturated with thoughts of God. One day he said to Sister Devmata, A man who has realized God must keep on realizing him all his life. To realize God is the aim of every human being whether he knows it or not. No man who has not true love towards God can be religious. Religion begins with attraction to God and no soul will ever find real satisfaction until he has reached God. All bondage comes to an end when man realizes him. The realization of God cannot be attained in a haphazard way. There is a regular method. First you must hear, then you must understand what you hear and from understanding you go on to realization. You must know the light is there 
otherwise you may go in the opposite direction to find it. Next, you must hear from a teacher how to do it. Then you must understand clearly just what it is, and when you have understood, realization will come. 98. To realize God one needs a pure mind, and the mind becomes pure through unselfish action. Karma Yoga, or unselfish action, is sometimes confusing to people. To explain this, one day Ramakrishnananda told Sister Devmata, work for others is self-amelioration. We need to serve others in order to lift ourselves up out of the state of degradation and selfishness into which we have fallen. We should be grateful to the needy for making it possible for us to raise ourselves. That is the only real good that comes out of all that we do for others, we merely better ourselves. 99. According to Vedanta philosophy, the microcosm and macrocosm are not different, they originate from the same substance. Ramakrishnananda embodied this philosophy. In addition to religion and philosophy, he had a wide range of knowledge in physical science and mathematics. Once he said, actually time, space, and causation are not separate entities outside, they all exist in me, that is, in my mind. The whole universe is inside man. Science is the struggle of man in the outer world. Religion is the struggle of man in the inner world. Science makes man struggle for truth in the outside universe, and religion makes him struggle for truth in the inner universe. Both struggles are great, no doubt, but one ends in success and the other ends in failure. That is the difference. Religion begins where science ends. The whole scientific method is based on observation and experiment, but the moment man realizes that there is something beyond observation and experiment, he will give them up and leave material science behind. Science will always have to deal with finite bodies, and God is infinite, 100 a real lover always thinks of the beloved and would never do anything to displease the beloved. The stories of Ramakrishnananda's love for Sri Ramakrishna are now legends in the order. Once he told Sister Devmata, the true devotee never thinks of himself. He is so full of the thought of God that his own self is forgotten. This body is only an instrument, a passive instrument, and an instrument really has no existence of its own, for it is wholly dependent on the one who uses it. Suppose a pen were conscious, it could say, I have written hundreds of letters, but actually it has done nothing, for the one who holds it has written the letters. So because we are conscious, we think we are doing all these things, whereas, in reality, we are as much an instrument in the hand of a higher power as the pen in our hands, and he makes all things possible. 101 Life means struggle. Only two types of people do not struggle, the dead and the illumined who have transcended the pairs of opposites. One day someone complained about dryness in spiritual life. That very complaining, Ramakrishnananda answered, shows that their devotion is strong, even though they may not seem to express it so well as at other times. The very fact that they are restless proves that this dryness of heart is an unnatural condition for them, just as the fish feels dryness and jumps about when it is out of water, water being its natural element. Their devotion is not lessened in any way. So long as the hunger for devotion to God is there, a man is steady in devotion. 102 In spiritual life, where self-effort ends, self-surrender begins. A real monastic always surrenders himself to God and depends on his own self. Sister Dev Mata recalled, Shortly before I left Madras, as we were driving back from the city one evening, I expressed regret that I was leaving when he had so few to help him. The answer that came was direct and uncompromising, He do not need anyone to help me. I am all full of God. What need have I of anyone else? If he sends people to help me, I am satisfied.
If he does not send, I am satisfied. I know that whatever he sends is for my good and is the best thing for me. 103 It is exhilarating to live with a God-intoxicated person. That person showers divine bliss, which makes worldly intoxication seem dull and boring. Sister Devmata wrote in her days in an Indian monastery, one imbibes what one lives with. One's habit of thought is determined by the trend of one's conversation. Swami Ramakrishnananda once said to me, Mind is like a big mirror which gives a perfect reflection, but which has been so thickly covered with dirt that nothing can be seen in it. The more you can rub off that dirt, the more you will be able to see yourself in it. The more you can remove the least speck of dust, the more you can get a perfect image of your true self. What is the dirt that hides the image? Selfish desires. Be free from every selfish desire. That is purity. Purity means singleness. Desire is a very dangerous thing. Sometimes we think we have killed all selfish desires, but somewhere in our mind there lingers some remnant, and as from a spark left in the corner of the hearth may come again a big fire, so out of that small remnant may spring a huge fire of desire. One evening someone asked Swami Ramakrishnananda how one should practice meditation. His answer was, meditation means complete self-abandonment. Meditation requires complete annihilation of self-consciousness. You know that before a great light, lesser lights disappear. So before the effulgent glory of God, the little glory of the ego will completely vanish as stars vanish when the sun rises. You must therefore practice the presence of God inside you. You may say, I cannot see Him with these eyes of mine. I cannot hear Him with these ears. How then am I to perceive Him? You can never perceive Him in this way. To go to the Creator you must throw aside these instruments which take you directly to the creation. You must go beyond your mind and senses, then meditation will come of itself. This is the only way to get inner vision. These senses are made for the creation, not for the Creator. 104 Last days Ramakrishnananda's life was short but eventful. For 14 years, he worked hard to spread the message of Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda in South India. He burnt his energy quickly. In April 1911, shortly after the Holy Mother's departure for Calcutta, Ramakrishnananda became seriously ill with diabetes and tuberculosis. He said that the cause of this breakdown was that Madras life was too strenuous. Due to overwork and lack of proper food, he had literally worked himself to the point of death. Ramakrishnananda was too humble to take credit for the success of the Madras Center. He said, It is no credit of mine. The Master's Grace and Swamiji's command are mainly responsible for the success of my work in the South. 105 At the request of the devotees, Ramakrishnananda moved to Bangalore Ashrama for a change in climate and rest. Unfortunately, the bracing climate of Bangalore failed to improve his health, and the local doctors diagnosed his disease as galloping tuberculosis. Brahmananda and Sardananda asked him to go to Calcutta for better treatment. Ramakrishnananda left for Calcutta in June 1911 via Madras. Brahmananda was then at Puri, but when he received a cable from Madras, he hastened to the railway junction at Khurda Road to meet his sick brother. As soon as the train arrived, Brahmananda entered the rail car and was shocked on seeing Ramakrishnananda's emaciated body. Brahmananda exclaimed, Shashi, what is this? Shake it off. Ramakrishnananda prostrated before him and replied, Raja, that is possible only through your blessings. 106. Maharaj asked him to follow the advice of the doctors implicitly. This was their last meeting.
On 10th June 1911, Ramakrishnananda arrived in Calcutta. He was accommodated in the Udbodhan office and placed under the treatment of noted physicians. In spite of the best treatment possible and careful nursing, his condition gradually deteriorated. But Ramakrishnananda's mind dwelt on his guru. One day, Kaviraj Durga Prasad Sen, who had treated Sri Ramakrishna, asked the Swami, Do you see such things as a crematorium or a tulsi, basil, grove in your dreams? Ramakrishnananda replied, No, I don't see them, but I frequently see the Master, Holy Mother, Swamiji, Dakshineswar, and so on. In my dreams, 107 Ramakrishnananda had dry skin because of an excessive bile secretion in his system and he suffered from a burning sensation in his body. His attendants had to fan him almost continually. He would roll on the bed restlessly and pray, Victory to the Master! Victory to my Guru! His desire for food was almost gone. He ate very little. In the morning he would eat a few pieces of cream cracker biscuits soaked in milk and at noon a few morsels of rice with milk. Sardananda often sat by his side at mealtime and persuaded him to eat a little more. One day Ramakrishnananda said, Brother Sharat, my eating is being gradually stopped. The Divine Mother 20. Does not allow me to eat anymore. Please don't take the trouble of coming to me during my mealtime. 108 Premananda visited him quite often. One morning he came and gave some instructions to Ramakrishnananda's attendants regarding his service, but Ramakrishnananda did not like this and scolded Premananda. However, when Premananda left, the Swami stopped eating and began to cry. Later, at Ramakrishnananda's request, his attendant brought Premananda back from Balaram's house. Putting his head at Premananda's feet, Ramakrishnananda began to sob like a child. What happened, brother? Premananda asked. Ramakrishnananda replied, Brother, I lost faith in the Master, please kick my face. Premananda said, It is impossible for me to believe that Shashi has lost faith in the Master. It is beyond imagination. Ramakrishnananda said, The Master showed me your greatness and who you are. And I became rude to you, that proved I lost faith in the Master. Premananda asked him to eat his meal and fed him with his own hand. 109 One day Ramakrishnananda's younger brother came to see him. Ramakrishnananda told him to remind their mother to make an offering to the Divine Mother that she had promised when Ramakrishnananda was three years old. Upon returning home, the Swami's brother learned from their mother that it was true, and he immediately fulfilled his dying brother's wish. Another day his mother, Bhavsundari, came to see him. He leaned his head towards her and said, Mother, Put your palms on my head and bless me, 110, and she blessed her loving son. Ramakrishnananda's condition rapidly worsened and he began to cough up blood. He lost sleep at night, his body was reduced to a skeleton. One day, unable to bear the physical pain, he asked his attendant to bring down the picture of Sri Ramakrishna from the wall. Holding it, he said plaintively, Master, why do you put me to all this suffering? I have committed no sin consciously with this body. Why then is all this suffering allotted to me? Then he immediately begged forgiveness for blaming the Master. Master, I made mistakes. Please forgive me. 111 He then asked his attendant to put the picture of the Master in its proper place. Sometimes he would forget his suffering and would passionately talk about the Master for a long time. When the attendant would ask him to keep quiet, the Swami would reply, When I talk about the Master, I lose body consciousness, and even the death pain becomes insignificant. 112 During his last days he became inspired when he talked about Christ, 
and he would relate how Sri Ramakrishna had regarded him as Christ's companion in his previous life. He also recalled how the Master received the vision of Christ while he was in Samadhi, and the very body of Christ had entered into his own. Even in delirium Ramakrishnananda would utter the divine names, Durga, Durga, Shiva, Shiva, Shri Guru, Shri Guru. One morning at 9 a.m., a couple of days before his passing away, the Swami was lying down with closed eyes. His attendant was silently seated nearby. All of a sudden Ramakrishnananda got up and told the attendant, The Master, Mother and Swamiji have come. Please offer them an asana, prayer rug, dot. The attendant was dumbfounded. Again the Swami repeated, Can't you see? The Master has come. Spread the carpet and set three bolsters. The attendant followed his order. Ramakrishnananda with folded hands bowed down thrice and then watched something unseen without blinking. After a while he said, they left. Now take away the carpet and bolsters. 1.13 Towards the end Ramakrishnananda expressed a desire to see Holy Mother, who was then at Jairambati, her birthplace. Swami Dhirananda was sent to bring dot her, but she could not come, perhaps for two reasons. First, she knew that it would be unbearable for her to witness Ramakrishnananda's death. Second, there was not enough room in Udbodhan for her to stay. However, the Swami was blessed with a vision of Holy Mother on His last night of earthly life. Ramakrishnananda exclaimed, Ah, Mother has come. On the morning of His last day, Pulin Mitra, a famous singer and disciple of Brahmananda, came to see Him. Ramakrishnananda expressed His vision in a Bengali line, Polo Dukharajani, the night of misery is over, and asked Pulin to take it to Girish Chandra Ghosh, the great dramatist and disciple of the Master, to compose a song. Girish recalled, by the grace of Sri Ramakrishna, I completed the composition immediately. Pulin Mitra sang it before him. He was greatly moved and was satisfied with the composition. 114 here is a translation of the song composed by Girish. The night of misery is over. The terrible nightmare of ego is gone forever. The illusion of life and death is no more. Lo, the light of knowledge is dawning, and the Mother Divine is smiling. The Mother is bestowing the boon of fearlessness. Sing victory in a loud voice. Proclaim the conquest of death by blowing the trumpet. Let the name of the Mother vibrate all over the world. The Mother says, Weep no more. Look at the feet of Ramakrishna. Then all worries will vanish, all pain will go. Son, look at my side. The Saviour of the world is standing with his eyes full of grace and compassion. Pulin sang this song for a long time and Ramakrishnananda listened with rapt attention. It seemed that the song gave him peace because it tallied with his vision. After this he desired to hear another, a song on Samadhi composed by Swami Vivekananda. Pulin sang that also. Ramakrishnananda was in an ecstatic mood that whole morning. Dr. J. N. Kanzilal checked him and found him in better condition. He drank a little sanctified water that had been offered to the Master and for the last three hours of his life he was in Samadhi. At 1 p.m. he began to perspire, his face flushed, the hair of his body stood on end and his gaze was fixed between his eyebrows. Swami Ramakrishnananda left his body while in Samadhi at 1.10 p.m. on Monday, 21st August 1911. The brother disciples and other monks began to chant the name of Sri Ramakrishna and they observed that the hair on Ramakrishnananda's body remained erect for a long time. Later his body was brought down from the first floor and Sister Nivedita bowed down to the departed monk. He was decorated with flowers and garlands and then was carried in a procession. The air was laden with the fragrance of flowers 
परफ्यूम एंड इंसेंस असंकीर्तन पार्टी ए ग्रुप ऑफ सिंगर्स लेट द प्रोसेशन इट फर्स्ट स्टॉप एट द कोस सीपोरे गार्डन हाउस देन एट द कोस सीपोरे क्रिमेशन ग्राउंड एंड क्रोसिंग द गैंजीज एट लास्ट इट रीच बेलूर मैथ Ramakrishnananda's body was cremated on the bank of the Ganges at the southeast corner of the Vivekananda temple. When the news of his death reached Holy Mother, she remarked with tearful eyes, "Alas, Shashi is gone. My back is broken." After receiving the sad news at Puri, the grief-stricken Brahmananda exclaimed, "The guardian angel of the south has passed away." The southern side is, as it were, covered with darkness the hindu community of madras convened a memorial meeting and paid their homage to ramakrishnananda who had sacrificed his life for their spiritual development sister dev mata wrote what saint paul declared in his epistle to the galatians yet not i but christ liveth in me perfectly described swami ramakrishnananda's attitude towards himself and towards that one whom he called guru He was dead wholly to himself and alive only in Shri Ramakrishna 115